Well, good morning, everyone. Let's uh, continue our study of an introduction to the doctrine of marriage. And once again, I want to remind you that this is only an introduction. Okay, once again, only an introduction to the doctrine of marriage. And we want to take a look at one particular facet of marriage, and that is the psychological glue, which is communication. And uh, we have noted in the past that the scripture gives us this particular instruction in Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, we have looked so far at letter A, which is be committed to honesty. And then now letter B, don't give the devil an opportunity. We have looked at several subpoints under this, and we have noted at uh, point six or our sixth subpoint that uh, partners within a marriage should not use sins of the tongue. There are many passages of scripture which deals with that deal with sins of the tongue, and we took uh, one or two passages actually, which are somewhat obscure uh, compared to the others. And the first one is found in Proverbs 18 and verse 14. And we have seen that a spirit can be wounded by verbal sins, so that when you use verbal attacks on someone, that it can actually wound their spirit. When, when a spirit is wounded, then we can go to Proverbs 18, 19 and find that that person is called an offended brother and that that offended brother is, then has the propensity and proclivity to not rebound uh, and get back into the same relationship that you had before because the wound is so deep. And what usually happens is that when there is a relationship between two people and somebody says an unkind word, says uh, a sinful word, says a damaging word, the person who says those words is unwilling to recognize how disastrous and how uh, destructive those words were. And I, too, uh, was raised under the motto of sticks and stones, you know, can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And that works up to a point until you're maybe by yourself in the dark of the night and you start to think over what happened. And maybe it happened that day or maybe it happened years before. And those words come back and the pain is there. And so we have seen in Proverbs 18, verses 14 and 19, that particular wounding, why it takes place, and that it is that which comes from a verbal sin. In James chapter 3, in, the, in verses 1 through 18, we see that there is a member within our bodies that is called the tongue. And that all of us were actually or most of us, the vast majority of human beings, were born with tongues, and that the tongue is the first organ that we use for the capturing of knowledge. It is our first uh, organ of perception. And we may not know everything, but as a baby, we will take our toes and we'll stick them in our mouth and our tongue will feel around and, oh, those are toes. Well, we don't know that they're toes, we just know that they're little bumps that we're able to feel. And as we get older and older, we find that there are other senses that we can use and that we can use them to learn. We have sight and we're able to recognize mom when she comes to change our diapers. And when mom smiles, we find that we can smile back. And when mom smiles back at us, there's a certain amount of good feeling that happens because we have now captured some communication. We go to the ear gate and we find that mom might sing lullabies to us and we are soothed at night and we're able to go to sleep. We smell the porridge in the morning when it's time for breakfast or the pablum or whatever it is that you were given as a baby. And as that comes up to your mouth, 
your nose picks up the aroma of that food and say, oh man, I think this is going to taste good. Now, you were raised here in the United States and you love the way Quaker Oats smelled and tasted. But somebody in South Africa smelled crushed cashews. And they came in a spoonful with a little bit of milk in it or some kind of oil. And mm, that tasted good to them. Now, to me, there are some things that kind of, I have to admit, my nose turns away from it. I just don't, don't like that idea. And uh, I don't like the idea of eating suet, for instance. Uh, when I smell suet, it, it kind of gives me the creeps, you know. I, I want to make soap out of it or something. Actually, if I can get away with not touching it or looking at it, I'm going to feel just fine. But the tongue is the very first organ that we have for perception. And it turns out that it is not only the first organ for perception, but it is the organ that we use to cut other people down. It is the organ that we use to cut ourselves down. It is the organ that we use to blaspheme God. And so that is what we are looking at. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. If you would care to open your Bibles, it would be a good idea. The untamed tongue, verse 1, begins with, so you really want to be a teacher. Really? Don't you know that a teacher is a person who uses their tongue to communicate knowledge to another person, but that that person is going to be held to a higher standard than the rest? Are you sure you want to do this? But there is something within the human soul, the human nature that says, I want to show them that I'm smarter than them because I want to teach them. It may be something that they already know, but you want them to know that you know it too, and you probably knew it before they did. It's kind of the infantile conversations that some babies have, you know, like I was potty trained at three. Well, I was potty trained at two. Two and a half, actually, but I say two. You know, like it makes that much difference, but it does to the infantile babies. Well, I've been potty trained six months longer than you. Most times, every once in a while, I do have an accident, particularly at night. The dog barks and whoops, look out. And so the tongue is used by us, even as adults to browbeat somebody else, to pound somebody else down into the ground just to show them I'm better than you. I'm your teacher. And so verse 1 of James chapter 3 says, we really don't want to be teachers because a teacher is going to be held to a higher standard. But you see, when you're judging somebody else, you're making yourself the standard. And when you make yourself the standard, it means that you are above everyone else. And that way, everybody else has to come up to your level or they just don't measure up. If God says, there's a level higher than you, wake up, baby. Verses 2 through 5, we are told that everybody stumbles. And so if your Bibles are open, let me read a little bit from those verses. Um, Hebrews chapter 3. James. James. Did I say? Okay. Comes right after Hebrews. There we go. What is it they say? You know, my tongue got in front of my eye teeth so I could see what I was saying. <laughs> That's just awful. Okay, verse 2 of James chapter 3. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the, the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us and we direct their entire body as well, look at the ships also. Though they are so great, and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. 
So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire? And so in these verses, we see that everybody stumbles. And everybody stumbles because the tongue is that instrument that trips us so that we stumble. And just like horses are maneuvered by putting a bit in their mouths, and just the ships are maneuvered by the tilling of the rudder, your life is maneuvered by that little organ inside your mouth by what it says. And a horse or a ship, they go to where they're told because the pilot of the ship knows where he's going. The trainer of the horse knows what he wants or what he expects from a horse. But your mouth, your tongue, where does it get its direction from? And we will see, of course, that in the area of sins that we are able to categorize sins as, first of all, mental attitude sins. These are the, the sins that you have inside your, your mind. They then progress to verbal sins, which in turn progress to overt sins. So everybody stumbles, and we were able to see that. Uh, last week, we took a look at uh, horses, and we saw how the bit fits in your mouth and how it hurts the, small, the uh, soft tissue and the palate. We t also took a look at the ship's rudder, and we saw how a ship uh, uh, is the direction that a ship takes is de uh, determined by the rudder. And uh, now we uh, see that the tongue is a small thing. It is something that is small within our bodies, but it does the same thing to us. In verses 6 through 18, we see that the tongue is called a fire. And so verse 6 says, and the tongue is a fire. So what exactly does it mean that the tongue is a fire? Well, we've just had reference to somebody driving on a forest road, flicking a lit cigarette out the, the window, and the forest goes on fire. Or maybe it was just through some negligence that the forest caught on fire. I have a distant relative, a relative through marriage, that when he was a teenager, actually, yeah, he was a teenager, wasn't quite into high school yet, and uh, he and one of the neighbor boys went behind the house, crossed the river, which was only about ankle deep at that time, and they would go way back there into the forest, and that's where they would break out their Marlboro and Lucky Strikes, because, you know, they're teenage boys. And uh, sometimes they were able to sneak a six-pack of beer out there, and they would make a little forest fire, and they would have a hamburger or a hot dog and slick their beer down. Well, one day they didn't put out the fire. They walked back across the river, went to bed that night, and that whole hill behind that house caught fire. They were held liable by the state for hundreds of thousands of dollars for the timber that was lost. And all that it was, I mean, they put the fire out, but they didn't get it all out. There was a little negligence. There was a little spark that was left. And it caught the rest of the, it caught the rest of the hillside on fire. That is the same way it happens in our lives. We say something, it seems like such a small little thing but it has great impact later on on those that surround us. Verse 6 goes on to say, <clears throat> the very world of iniquity. Now I want you to look at this phrase because the Greek doesn't say that. The Greek says that the tongue is the cosmetic of your life. But the word world is used in there because the that's how you get the word cosmos. Cosmos is the Greek word. And the word means an arrangement. And so on the screen, as you can see uh, uh, right now, I have a, an image there of several of our planets. And um, maybe you're able to identify some of them just by looking at them. But there are some planets. 
and they are just helter-skelter on the screen. And what happens in our universe is that there is a sun, and the sun has such incredible mass, even though it's all gaseous, it has such incredible mass and gravity that it actually orders the way in which these planets are going to revolve around it as the governing star. It takes the sun to organize the solar system. And we call it a system because it's organized. See? And so we can say that the sun is the cosmetic because that's what organizes the planets. That's why the, the space in some scientific circles is called the cosmos. Because there's an order. There's an orderliness to it. See? And it is the sun because of its size, its density, its mass, its gra gravity. It makes the order as to how these planets are going to be in relation to one another. <coughs> Maybe you can recognize this. This <laughs> is what a refrigerator looks like. No, <laughs> I know it doesn't look good. <laughs> I had a refrigerator <laughs> when, uh, before I met Julie, I was single, and I had uh, a garden growing in there. It was all fungus, <laughs> it was nothing edible. It started out as edible, but it wasn't afterwards. And so you can see, for instance, that there is the two liter bottles of pop that are here. Let me ask you a question. How come they're not standing up? They can't, because the shelf is too low. And uh, look at how there are eggs up here. How come they're not just sitting on the shelf? Because they're going to roll off. See? And so there is a designing factor, a structural design that dictates where things are going to go in the refrigerator so that you don't have a mess. Every once in a while it happens to me. I, I don't know that it ever happens to you. but. I spill something on one of the shelves in the refrigerator. And it's a liquid thing. And it goes from the top shelf to the next shelf to the next shelf. And if you don't catch it fast, you're going to have to clean the whole thing up and reorganize it. See? And that is what the scripture says your tongue is. Your tongue is what organizes your life. This is a structure that organizes, and that's what a refrigerator is. It organizes where things are supposed to go and uh, how you are supposed to find them. <coughs> so the phrase says, it's the very world of iniquity, ho cosmos tes adikias. And what this is, is that there, that there is an organization that is taking place. Now, we have a noun form in our sentence, but I think it's important for us to see the verbal form so that we can see and get a better sense of this word to organize. And so there are three passages of scripture you can see them on the screen, Matthew 12 and verse 44, Matthew 23 and verse 29, and then Titus chapter 2 and verse 10. So let's go to the Matthew passages first and uh, look at those particular passages to see how this word actually means to organize. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 44. And let me begin to read at verse 43. 
Jesus is teaching here and he's giving some instruction on demons. One of these days, I think we ought to get cranked up and have a whole long session on the angelic conflict from beginning to the end. This is a deeper level of Bible study. It not only follows the history of mankind, but it follows the history of angelic beings and the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is Lord Sabaoth. He is the uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, verse 43. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds it unoccupied. In other words, demon are no longer there. It has been swept. There have been some changes made as far as the, uh, the house is concerned, some habits, some uh, <coughs> customs that the individual has had. And then it says, and put in order. You see that last phrase? That is our word, cosmos. The house has been put in order. When a person has been relieved of demonic possession, his life has to be put in order. And that's why it is incredibly important that when a person has a demon possession uh, history and he is now no longer demon possessed because he accepted Christ as personal savior, that he immediately get Bible doctrine as quickly and as often as possible. Because if he doesn't, his house is not ordered again. It is disordered. Okay, let's go to Matthew 23 and verse 29. Two pages down the road here. Matthew 23. <clears throat> Once again, the Lord Jesus is uh, speaking. And so he begins by saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. This is a, a statement which is directed uh, to the scribes and the Pharisees. And the word woe is it's an exclamatory remark. It's a, technically, it's an exclamatory particle in the uh, Greek, which is actually a transliteration from the Hebrew. And uh, the, uh, it has the strength of damn you, and so in this case, it would be, damn you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. Now see the word adorn? That is our word here. In other words, you fix it up so that it looks nice. <coughs> uh, there are several uh, cemeteries in this vicinity, but if you go down here, what is it, to... Uh, 41st and the freeway or 41st and Broadway there's a cemetery there there's the other cemetery over there by the mall and uh, when you look at it I mean that's a nice place all right now when you go to one of those places you're not apartment hunting right because you're not looking forward to you know I want one of those it's a it's a basement uh, apartment you know and you don't want one of those but they have people that are assigned to mow the lawn. There are people that come and they place flowers uh, at the various grave sites. Uh, they keep the grounds looking really nice. And if you're at the mausoleum section, they keep those sparkling clean because it's supposed to look nice. And that's the word adorn. And that means that things are organized so that they look right. They're put into order. So. Uh, you look at a cemetery and say, okay, that's not so bad of a place. I don't know that I want to move in there right away, but it's still a nice place. And so that's what this word means. Now, would you turn to Titus chapter 2, please? <coughs> Titus chapter 2. It's right after the Timothys. And 
And I know we don't have any slaves here, but this would be addressed to you if you're a slave. If you're not a slave in our society, you would probably be an employee of somebody. And so verse 9 begins by saying, urge employees. And so I'm just going to substitute the word employee for bond slaves. Urge employees to be subject to their own bosses in everything, to be well-pleasing and not argumentative. <laughs> I know this is terribly convicting, so let's rush past this verse and go on to the next one. Not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. See the word? They will adorn the doctrine. And this is because when you're in the workplace, inevitably you are going to let out a word of witness. And people are going to say, well, that person's a Christian. What kind of freak is that? And then you let out another one. You say, oh, my goodness. And then they also do that. Well, rather than this just being a helter-skelter splattering of theological mud that goes on the wall, there's the adorning of the doctrine. Oh, this person does the job the way the boss likes it because this person is a Christian. Oh, this person doesn't steal anything because this person is a Christian. And so the doctrine, that is what we believe, is adorned because you fulfill it. And that is the picture that we have here. So in James 3, 6, when it says that the tongue is the very world of iniquity, it means that it is the cosmetic of your life. It orders your life. It makes your life look like what it is. So just like the sun organizes the planets, and just as the shelves and racks of a refrigerator dictate organization, your tongue sets in place factors around which your life will revolve. Maybe you've heard uh, somebody say, you know, one lie leads to another. You know why that is? Because the first lie doesn't measure up to the truth, so you have to change the next thing you say so it lines up with the first thing that you say. And so now your life has been morphed. It has been tweaked. See? Number three, your verbal constructs will arrange your overt activities. And so this is what we learn from this verse, verse six. Your verbal constructs, that is, in other words, the phraseology that you use, the very words, the vocabulary that you use, will arrange your verbal uh, or your overt activities. I remember I was at a meeting one time, and the lady wanted to say, that everybody who's at this meeting must be Christian, but they weren't. And so this lady who was facilitating this particular meeting said, since we are all people of prayer, and you see what that does? It just tweaks the truth enough so that from then on, what is a Christian? Well, it's anybody who prays. Well, you know what? I don't know anybody who doesn't pray. So all of us must be Christians. I mean, you could walk out on the street and everybody's a Christian. Letter B. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. And so we are told in the first clause that it is the cosmetic. It arranges everything in our life and our body. But now in the second clause we're told that it defiles the entire body. In other words, it tweaks it in such a way that instead of making your life better, it makes it worse. So you say, well, I better watch what I say from now on. Hello? I guess that's a good conclusion. And let her see, and sets on fire the course of your life. And sets on fire the course of your life. And that is just as your life cannot be relived again tomorrow because yesterday is yesterday, today is today, and tomorrow is tomorrow. You can't relive that. You can say, well, I can take back what I said. Here's my bell. I just rang it. You think I can unring it? It's been rung.
Okay, so up until now, we have don't give a devil an opportunity, verses 26 and 27 of Ephesians chapter 4. Don't use sins of the tongue. We've looked at Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, James 3, 1 through 18. And uh, we want to take a look at this aspect once again. Do you really want to be a teacher? The answer is no. Everybody stumbles, check. We talked about the horse's bit, yes. We talked about the rudder of the ship. We talked about the tongue being a small member. We've also talked about the tongue being a fire and that the tongue is a cosmetic of our life. What about comparing it to another passage of scripture? And this one is found in Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Would you open your Bibles to the Old Testament? And one of the reasons that I'd like to always cross-reference things to the Old Testament because sometimes people say that the New Testament is just so, something really new, it's innovative, and uh, it has no precedent. It has no uh, follow uh, or foundation, and as a result, it should not be followed. So if you look at Proverbs 4, and let me get there myself here. Verse 23, watch over your heart with all diligence. Earlier this morning I'd asked, what is it that stimulates the tongue to say the things that it says? Well, we find from the scripture and not just this passage that the tongue is stimulated by the soul or by the heart as it is mentioned here. Because the heart has been um, perverted through the old sin nature, the tongue is perverted by the old sin nature and says perverse things. So verse 23, watch over your heart with all diligence. In other words, don't have such high self-esteem that you forget the fact that you are a sinner and you are going to say things. Things that are not complimentary, things that are unkind, things that are damaging, things that are destructive, you are going to say those things. I know this has happened to me, and there's, I'm sure that it's happened to you. At least I have the suspicion that it's happened to you. Somebody will say, wait, you're not supposed to say that. And then you say, in your mind, yes, I am. But really, you're not. Because your self-esteem is too high. You need to know that you are a sinner and that you are capable of saying that. In fact, you're capable of saying much worse. So verse 23, uh, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. The springs of life. In other words, this is what constitutes the way in which your life is maneuvered from that point on. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. We've discussed that. It uh, sets on fire the course of your life. And it is set on fire by hell set on fire by hell. And what this is is that there's an association that when you put a match close to paper and the match is on fire, the paper is going to combust. And this is the idea that you have. You can't have an old sin nature and not be holding hands with hell itself. And so as believers, you must be aware that that is taking place. In verses 7 through 8, we have the taming of the monster. So if we go back to James chapter 3, let's check this out as to what this monster is. We're going to find that the scripture tells us that man, that is the human race, has tamed horses, has tamed crocodiles, has tamed snakes, has tamed all kinds of beasts, but not the tongue. And so verses 7 and 8 of James chapter 3. For every species of beasts and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and it is full of deadly poison. 
There's the taming of the monster. Then there is the fresh water and the black water, and I think we looked at that once uh, or twice uh, last week. Verse uh, 9 uh, begins that with our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. And you can look all the way down to verse 12, and we can see that there is an inconsistency with fresh water and black water. Uh, black water is a nice way that we say that the toilet has overflown. And it's probably happened in every home that the toilet has overflown and somebody has to put on the galoshes and they have to go and unplug the toilet and whatever solids are floating around in the water, they have to be taken care of. Nobody likes to do that. Nobody likes to walk or to wade through black water. So how would you like to take your bottle of water and scoop up a little bit and take a swig? No, thank you. And that's what this is saying. Verse 10 through 12, we have a phrase where it says, these things ought not to be. And so let me begin here at, uh, at verse uh, from the same mouth come both blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not to be this way. And that phrase, these things ought not to be this way, is like self-explanatory. Anybody knows about it except when you are involved in an argument. In which case you are willing to go the second mile and gargle black water. But the scripture says these things ought not to be. In other words, this is something you don't want to go into. Verses 13 through 18, we have a phrase, the wise and understanding. Verse 13, who among you is wise and understanding? See that? It's a, it, it's a pair. It's not just who of you is wise and who of you is understanding. It's a pair. It's both of them together. And the reason for this is that in our minds, we are able to take the disguise of somebody who knows something and then somebody who's an expert in something. And so this is where you can see the pride of man coming up. First of all, I know more than you. But then it can take another step further down into the Blackwater Beach and say, I am an expert. And so this verse, who among you is wise and understanding, let him show by his good behavior his deed in the gentleness of wisdom. Now notice the rest of this verse. Yeah, okay, you say you're smart, you say you're an expert. Let's see your expertness in the gentleness of wisdom. Because the person who says, hey, I'm an expert, that person becomes oppressive. That person becomes tyrannical when he's addressing you. But not the person who's controlled by the Spirit of God. And that's what we have here. Who can tame the tongue? I can't. You can't. The Spirit of God can. That's why you need to keep your sins confessed. So that the Spirit of God can take control of your life. This is a pair of terms that has its roots in the Old Testament. In other words, this pair, it isn't an accidental uh, choice of words, wise and understanding. It has its roots in Deuteronomy 113 and 15 and Deuteronomy 4 and verse 6. There, it's in there. And it's important for us to know that when the, when, the, uh, when the writer of James is writing this, he's just not shooting things into the air, hoping that something will stick. He has something in mind. The word uh, sophos is used for the practical teacher. This is James 3.1. And then there's the word epistemon, uh, which is the word for an expert. 
somebody who's skilled, a scientific person. Uh, and this is a person who has that tone of superiority. These two types of people have been known since the beginning of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 1, for crying out loud. So, the person who is wise and understanding, let him show. Or we could say, let him put his money where his mouth is. Let him show the gentleness of wisdom. Let him show how wisdom has not just puffed him up, but he is able to show the sinner the way that he should take, and he can do it with gentleness. It's remarkable that the truly wise man is always characterized by a calm spirit, a mild and placid demeanor, and by a gentle, though firm, enunciation of his sentiments of truth. And so it's important to be able to get that. Now, it is the last part that stumbles most people because they say, if you're truly gentle, then you should actually be persuaded to my side of the argument. The answer is no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you feel that way, but no. This is what the Bible says. This is true wisdom. You're the one that has to change. I'm sorry that your mind has hit this vapor law. <clears throat> the gentleness of wisdom. One of the marks of wisdom is gentleness. The Greek word uh, for gentle is the word prautete, or praute, and it occurs in non-biblical literature to describe a horse that someone has broken and had trained to submit to a bridle. On the uh, screen, you are able to see an old painting here. And this is Alexander, and he is taming his horse, Bucephalus. It's a, two, it's a compound word, B-U-C-E, Buce, is a word which means ox. And phallus here um, is head. So here was a horse that was called ox head because he was so dumb that he could not be trained. Nobody could train him. Everybody who tried to get on this horse would be knocked down and almost killed because he would be trampled. But you know that Alexander watched this horse, watched different people attempt to train this horse, and he figured out the way of having this mighty steed, this huge horse, follow his commands. And this horse followed him all the way across in the conquest of the ancient world to the Indus River, that is the very border of India, where he died in battle. What did he do? Well, Alexander the Great was watching as the other people were trying to tame this horse, and he noticed that when the horse would see his shadow on the ground or on the sand at the horse, would jump. He was scared of his own shadow. So Alexander said to his father, if I can tame this horse, can I have it? And everybody laughed because nobody could tame this horse. And so he said, well, okay, if you want, uh, you can have this horse, but nobody can tame this horse. And so he took a piece of cloth and he wrapped it around the eyes of the horse and then he was able to lead that horse around, jump on that horse and take him out for a ride and everybody was surprised to death. And so this is the way in which even something which is huge, something which is strong, something much stronger can be tamed, you see. And that horse becomes gentle and can be serviceable to other people. <coughs> this word pictures strength under control, specifically the Holy Spirit's control. The evidence of this attitude is a deliberate placing of oneself under divine authority. And so the way in which you can be that peaceable person, the way that you can be that person who is serviceable 
to society is you put yourself under the authority of the Holy Spirit. You confess your sins. You take in Bible doctrine so that the, the word of God is the sword of the spirit and you can move forward. If you fail to do that, you're just a wild horse. You're not really any good to anybody. When I was 12 years old, I met my father's father for the first time. He was my grandfather. And my grandfather was a fairly wealthy man. He was actually very rich. And um, he had a bunch of horses. And um, before uh, I finished my visit with him, he said to me, uh, little Jesse, because I think that's what he called me. <laughs> he said, uh, why don't you go out in the corral and pick a horse? You can have anyone you want. And there must have been 20 out there, you know. And, uh, so I went out and I looked through the gate and I looked at all the horses. And because I was enamored with the Lone Ranger, I wanted a white horse. <laughs> you know, even Hopalong Cassidy has a white horse. I wanted a white horse. Well, there was one white horse in there. And I said, I want that one. He said, no, you don't want that one. It's not even green broke. And I said, yeah, but it's a white horse. I want that horse. And he said, well, OK, come back and get it. <laughs> Wait, I couldn't hardly even get near him. And I promised to come back a year later or whenever my parents would take me back. Never went back. You see, a horse that isn't broken, a horse that, that uh, even though he's very strong, even though uh, that strength abounds if he has not been domesticated or has been broke so as to be gentle he's not good for anybody and that's the way that you are you're not good to anybody if you're not under the control of the Holy Spirit this is why not only when you come in here you take a few moments to confess your sin but you need to confess your sin every day multiple times a day it's important that you do so Okay, I can't see the clock up there. Let me see what time. It's time for us to take a break. Let's take a break. <laughs>